So you know how every family kind of has those stories and those that that embarrassing thing that you did or said that one time that they've never let you live down? Well, here's one of mine. When I was like 13 years old, I think, um, you know, one time I'm I'm spending the night at my friend Tim's house, you know, no big deal. We're hanging out. I spend the time spend the night there. I come home. A few days later, I'm uh, I wake up in the morning. I'm you know, just doing my thing. I'm watching TV, whatever I'm doing at, at 13 years old. And uh, I'm not particularly observant at that age, I'm sure. But at some point, I start to notice that nobody else is just sitting around watching TV or anything on a Saturday morning. Everybody's kind of moving around and hustling and bustling. And there's there's movement going on. And I, I see a suitcase being pulled out. And I, I start walking around and looking. And everybody's, like, packing. Everybody's pulling out suitcases and packing for something. I'm like, what is going on? So I asked my mom, what, what's going on over here? And, and she says, we're packing. And lo looks at me like, what are you talking about? Obviously we're packing. I'm like, packing for what? And she says, we're going to Florida. And I'm like, we're going to Florida? And that is one of those lines that my family throws in my face all the time that I will never, ever hear the end of. And, and in my defense, I will say she told everybody while I was at my friend Tim's house, and that's why I didn't know. So it wasn't my fault. But here I am in the middle in the middle of everybody packing, and everybody else knows what's going on, and I'm the only one who doesn't. And that line, we're going to Florida, is one that I hear pretty much every time I see my brothers. And the reason I tell this story is to ask, have you been in a situation like that where there are things going on behind the scenes that you had no idea were going on? Maybe even that sound totally far-fetched and unlikely that they'd be going on. And the reason I ask that question is because we're looking at a passage today in the book of Ephesians where it talks about God doing exactly that. We're, we're starting a new series teaching through the book of Ephesians where we're going we're gonna to dive in and we're going to go through the text and, and we're going to just try to understand what Paul has to say for us. It, it's, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul, probably written in the early 60s AD, probably written while he's in prison in Rome. And uh, and I got to say, this is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And anytime you ever hear me talk about a book of the Bible, I'm going to say it's one of my favorites because they all are. But this one really is special. This one really is unique and awesome in a lot of ways. And we're going to see that. We're going to see over the next few weeks how you, you the first half of the book, like chapters one through three, just talk about about Jesus' saving power and talk about the things that God has done for us and talk about salvation and, and so many things connected to that. And then the the second half is just, okay, so now what do we do with that? Chapters four through six just talk about, it, it's like a guide for how we can participate in that saving power in, in what God has done for us. And so we're going to start this morning at, at the beginning or morning, you know, whenever you're watching this or listening to this. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. So I'd encourage you, pause the video, pause the audio right now, grab a Bible, pull it up on your computer, your phone, or whatever, pull up a Bible somewhere, and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Go ahead and pause it and do that. So in chapter 1, right at the beginning, Paul introduces this, the letter in a pretty typical way for Paul. Um, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, so he says, Paul, an apostle, apostle being a word that means emissary or ambassador or representative, right? He says, he's, he's writing this, he says that he is an apostle of Jesus. And, and he says that on the one hand, that shows his authority in, er, in the early church that you should listen to something I have to say because that word apostle me, meant something to those people that he's writing to, to the early Christians, right? So he's showing his authority, but he says, by the will of God. And that's a big thing for Paul and a big thing we're going to see in the book of Ephesians that he wants us to understand the things he says in this book are not coming from him. It's not about him and his authority and who he is. It is about what God has revealed to him, that he didn't earn this, that God has done something incredible, that God has revealed these mysteries and truths to him. And that he, he is privileged to get to share those with everybody he meets, that everybody he gets the chance to share them with. But God has revealed things to us and to Paul and, and to us through Paul and to us even separately from Paul, that God has revealed stuff and that is something special. And so he says, I'm an apostle by the will of God. And, and that really, really sets the tone for the way he's going to talk in this letter. And who's it for? He says, to God's holy people in 
Ephesus in, in you know, this, this ancient Greek city and, and surrounding region to, to the believers there. And really the way he writes this letter and a lot of other factors really make it sound like this, he really expected this letter to be kind of widely circulated. He really talks about things in a way that are generic, whereas some, you know, for example, you read 1 Corinthians, it's like, they had some drama going on that he was addressing. Whereas Ephesians is just kind of generic and there's a lot less specific stuff about specific circumstances going on in Ephesus, as far as we can tell. It seems pretty broad and pretty general that, you know, this is something you could pass around and everybody could benefit from, right? It's not just too laser focused on one group of people. And so he he, he writes to them, he's, he greets them with grace and peace, which there's a whole lot we could say about that, about, you know, Paul's kind of go-to greeting, but we'll we'll that'll that'll be a story for another time but what we're going to focus on this morning is one really long run-on sentence in 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 the original greek language the english translations often you know typically try to break it down into more manageable digestible sentences but even then <laughs> um it, we're, we're just going to read some run-on sentences here um in in uh ephesians chapter one starting in verse three and we're going to read through 14 he says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect with when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we, all, we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Right. So there there is so much here. There's so much we could unpack. And in a way, he's kind of he's kind of starting to give us a hint, a tease of some things that he's going to go into in more depth as the letter goes on. But but I love this passage. I love it for a lot of things about it. But one thing is just that in so many ways, it's such a concise description of what we mean when we talk about Jesus and what he has done and the good news of what Jesus has done for us. When we talk about the gospel, this is kind of a pretty good summary of, of most of the main points. Right. And so the gist of this passage, though, the gist of this, what it really boils down to is this. All of God has been working throughout all of time to save all of you. Right. All of God has been working throughout all of time to save all of you. All of God, it, it's, you know, he's listing all of these things that God is doing, that God has done, that God will do. And, and every, you know, it's like every other line is in Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus, under Christ Jesus, right? It's, it's just over and over, Jesus, 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 Jesus is at the core of everything that God is doing. And, and at, at the end of this passage, talking about being sealed with the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity is involved in this. All of God has been working throughout all of time, right? So he, he talks about being predestined and chosen before creation. We'll get into that in a minute, right? He talks about our past sins being forgiven and dealt with. He talks about in the presence that we're in the process of being redeemed. He talks about the future that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, right? All, working throughout all of time to save all of you, right? He talks about that Jesus addressing the penalty for our sin, Jesus tearing down the power of our sin. He talks about, you know, he, the way he talks about this, he, it's addressed to individuals and also to groups of people. And again, we'll talk about that more in a moment here. Where there's, but there's this talk of being chosen and included. This idea, you know, understanding that when he's writing to these early Christians, there are probably Jewish Christians there who, are, who have been Jews their whole lives, faithful Israelites who have, who have accepted the message of Jesus, and then other people who aren't who like probably most of us listening to this or watching this today 
are, are not Israelites, are not Jewish by descent, but came to know Jesus and, and have, have become a part of God's family in that way. And, and so he's, and he, that's going to be a big thing we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks, especially, right? But so he's, he's writing to like that this really applies to everybody. And he's going to talk to individuals. He's going to talk to groups, but this message is for everyone. All of God has been working throughout all of time to save all of you, right? And so through this passage, Paul just lays out just a series of blessings, a series of, of good things that God has done for us and to us. All right. God has just given us so much good and, and he lays out some of these. So, so we're just going to kind of go one by one here. First, he, ta- he says that God chose us. All right. Now this, the, when we're talking about terms like choosing, God choosing before creation, God predestining, right? There, there's a lot of different opinions about what that means. And really mainly there's a couple of major opinions about what that means. And you might be familiar with that. You might not. That's okay. Um, but basically there, there are different interpretations of what Paul's doing. But what, what I think is most significant and most faithful to the text and, and most the most you know, biblically faithful understanding of the writings of Paul is that he, in this passage, you're going to notice that he's talking about, for the first part, he's talking about us and we and us and we. And then later on towards the end of the passage we're looking at, he's going to say, and you also, right? So there's a group distinction he's talking about. What he's, what, and, and he defines who he's talking about um, down there in verse um, 11 and 12. He's talking about, you know, when he's talking about us, he's talking about us who first received the gospel. And then he's saying, and then you also received the gospel, right? And so, well, who is, who is it that first received the gospel that Paul is a part of? Well, it's the first followers of Jesus. And all the first followers of Jesus were from Israel, were from, were, were, were Israelites, were Jews. And so he's, he's talking about that. And there's some significant language here. Um, so you see throughout the Old Testament, this idea that God chose Israel to be his, his people. And he chose them not, you know, not, not for like just what he can do for them, although that was a part of it. He chose them for what he could do for the whole world through them. There was a mission involved. There was a purpose in choosing them that was beyond benefiting them. It was for the whole world, right? He chose them for a special role, a special mission. Okay. And so, and and there's this, there's this fun passage in Deuteronomy seven, where God basically says, you know, says through Moses, like, why do you think I chose you? Like, what's so special about Israel that I, do you think you were like this really large and great and impressive nation that like, that's why I picked you out? It's like, no, no, you weren't. You still aren't. You know, when he's writing that when, when Moses was taking these words from God in Deuteronomy, God, God's like, no, you, you aren't. And you weren't, weren't before and you, you aren't now, you know, like it, I didn't choose you because of your size or your impressiveness. What does God say? say? God says, I chose you because of my love for you right? God says, because I loved you, I chose you. And, and because I made promises to your ancestors and I'm keeping those promises, right? And God is demonstrating his love for the entire world because when he chooses Israel, it's not just like, I loved you and I hated everybody else. It's like, I loved you and I love so much, everybody else so much that I chose you to be my, my representatives and to use for my mission to reach the whole world. So the whole world can know that I love them. Right. So there's this purpose there. And so when when Paul is talking about God chose us, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about and, and, and especially in particular, he's talking about the segment of Israel that accepted Jesus and understood this is God's Messiah. This is God in the flesh and, and gave him their allegiance and, and put their faith and trust in him. OK, so all that to say this first blessing that God gives is he says that he chose us. And we're going to see as we go on to get to the bottom of, you know, of the page here to the, the end of the passage, we're going to see this applies to us, too, who, to all of us who have been included. But he says, he says in the same way that Israel was chosen, right? He's using that same kind of language. He says, God has chosen us before the creation of the world. What for? To be holy and blameless, right? He, there's something important about the fact that God, in some sense, picked us before we ever could have the chance to pick him, right? That long before you decided that God was worth your time, God decided that you were worth his time, God chose you first. And so in, in ultimately anything you ever do for God, anything you ever give to God, anything you ever sacrifice for him or anything like that, 
it is always a response to something he has done because he was there first and he was loving you first, right? So he says he, says he chose us. Next, he used this, uses this word that's translated predestined. God, um, he predestined us. What, you know, predestined for what? Well, he says he predestined us in love for adoption to sonship, right? So, so he's talking about that when, when he talks about predestination, he's not, he's not, what's in Paul's mind is not like, yes, God was sitting there before the creation of the world thinking, I'm going to create heaven and hell, and I'm going to decide who's going to go where. And, and even if you believe that that's true, that's not really where Paul's mind is at when he's writing this. That's not really the point of this passage. He's talking about that in God's love, he, he, he chose us beforehand, predestined us for adoption to sonship right? And, and who's included in that? Well, he says down in verses 12 and 13 that it includes everybody who puts their faith in Jesus. It's starting with us, and not me, us, but Paul, us, right? Paul, the, the first believers that came from Israel, that in that way, salvation came through, from God, through Israel, through Jesus, through Israel, right? And, and um, it, he says that it also includes you also, and again, we're going to get to that in a little bit, have become a part of this by putting your faith in Jesus. And so, what he's, what he's saying here, this, this idea this of adoption as sonship, right? That God has adopted us as his children. That God has, has the people that are part of God's team are not just, it's not just something you, you know, you do for fun. It's not just something that like you're a part of like an organization or a team or something. It's like, it's a family. God is actually adopting you as his child. And for some, for some of us, that's really meaningful because maybe you had a great dad and you can really identify with that. And for some of us, maybe your dad wasn't around much or maybe your dad was not such a great figure in your life. And for God to say, I adopted you and made you my own to be my children. Let's not miss the, va the importance and the value of what that means, of what he's saying, of the tenderness in that, of the love and concern and care in that. That whatever your father experience has been like, either with your father or as a father, God wants you to experience being his child and experience what it's like to have him as a father, right? And so God has, when we talk about predestination, maybe a more helpful way is kind of to think of, like God has said, this is what will happen for those who put their faith in me. Will you be part of that group? So this is what I have set apart, like what I've predestined for those who will put their faith in me. But who's going to be part of that group that puts their faith in me? Well, that's kind of up to you and me, right? Next up, God promises, um, God, God gives us this blessing of redemption, Paul says. In verse 7, he says, we were redeemed, we were bought out of slavery. This idea of, of you know, being freed from bondage, being freed from slavery. Again, this is, this is a, an ancient Israelite writing, you know, talking about being freed from bondage. Where, where an Israelite's mind is going to go is to the Exodus, to the Passover, to when God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. That was kind of fundamental. God brings it up nonstop throughout the Old Testament. Like everything God ever says, it's like, hey, Remember, I brought you out of slavery. I, I freed you or your ancestors, depending when he's when he's saying it, like from bondage, from actual slavery, right? And so, so Paul is saying similarly that we, what Jesus has done, what God has done through Jesus is, is like brought us out of slavery, kind of redeemed us as in like kind of bought us to set us free and freed us from bondage. With, which, you know, leads into, along with that, part of that is forgiveness of sins. You know, so Paul, again, you look back, he's, he's talking about being forgiven by the blood of Jesus. It's kind of, again, the, the, the ancient Israelite mindset can't help but go back to the Exodus, to the Passover, when you may be familiar with the story about that God was bringing judgment on Egypt, right? And, and God spares his people, the Israelites, from that, and he frees them from being slaves to the Egyptians, and and that they're what they're doing as a sign of this is to put the blood of a lamb over their doorpost, and that, excuse me, is the marker, the indicator that they are set apart for God, and that they that they will be spared, and that they will be spared from this this judgment that's coming, right? And so we're, we're he's saying in the same way he's using this imagery to kind of 
like try to bring that to mind and say that's what Jesus did. That's what God has done through Jesus is to free us from bondage through Jesus' blood instead of the blood of just some lamb, right? Uh, so and, and that th there's forgiveness of sins involved in that, right? And th that whatever we've done, whatever our past is, it doesn't have to define us anymore. We can be made new. We can be cleansed from the things that we've done before, right? The next blessing that God gives us is revelation. Paul talks about in verse 9 this mystery, um, it, th this word that could be translated secret, right? It's this idea that that there has been stuff that God has been up to that, that people didn't know about. We didn't know this was going on. It wasn't, you know, every once in a while he gives a little glimpse through through the Old Testament scriptures, through his prophets, through different events. Every once in a while we catch a little glimpse of, of things that God is doing behind the scenes. We start to understand a little bit more where God is coming from and what God is doing and what's important to him, right? And and Paul says that we've we've got this blessing that, that there are these things that God has been working on since before the creation of the world that God has been God has been working at that he's finally revealing to us. This whole Jesus thing took us all by surprise. Paul's saying like, I, w I didn't see it coming. It was like a secret. It was like God had this secret rescue plan and, and we're finally getting to see it start to happen. And like nobody saw it coming. No, nobody knew that this is how God was going to do it, but, but it is how he did it. And actually it makes sense. And he was giving us little hints of it that we may or may not have understood at the time, but God is, it's all been leading up to this moment. And now God has revealed things to us in these days. We like have the hindsight of or we, I'm sorry, we have the advantage of hindsight that we can look back and see what God has been doing. We can see the ways that God has been working up to this. All right. And so he's, he's saying we have this blessing of being, of having revealed to us kind of some of the secret things that God was doing that we didn't know about. And then we get to verses 11 and 12. Let me just reread re some of this for you. In him, we were also chosen. That word is a, is a Greek word that really, I mean, literally means like called. Um, and, and some translations might put it that way, right? And um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But we, we were chosen or called, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Again, that's Paul defining who he means by we, by us. But then he includes everybody else in what he's been talking about and, and as recipients of these promises or these, these blessings, because he says in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, right? So, so he's saying it started with us and you also have been brought into it. God, God chose Israel beforehand and even chose, you know, that, that there would be a, a segment of Israel that would, that would accept Jesus, that would, that would, you know, there, there would be a remnant of Israel that would, would hold on and, to God and, and be faithful to God by receiving Jesus and accepting the message and the life and teachings and the death and resurrection of Jesus and put their faith in him, right? And so, and he's saying, and likewise, you also are being brought into this, right? And so when he uses this word chosen or called, it's, it's a different word than what was used earlier on when he used the word, when he, when he said, God chose us. That was a different word before. Now the word he's using, it, it, it means like basically God has, God's got a place on the team for us. He's got a role for you. And so, so God, you know, it's, it's a different word than before. It's a different word than the one translated as predestined. It means I want you on my team and I have a role in mind for you. I have a job for you to do. Right. And so he, he's saying in him, we were also like appointed we were we were given this task we were given this mission right that god has invited us to be on his team and he's given us a part to play on that team and then um, lastly he concludes this passage this section by saying and and that god has sealed has given us a seal of the holy spirit and right so what he's talking about if you're familiar with like in olden times you know the, a king might have like a signet ring, ring that he would use to seal a letter right or or you think about like a down payment or something like that or like a you know when you get an apartment or you rent something expensive you put down a security deposit right it's something that's like a guarantee of what is to come later right he says he says, when you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory, right? So he's saying when you were given the, whole, given the Holy Spirit in coming to Jesus and accepting him and putting your faith in him, you were given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a guarantee that like, 
This is what's coming. God has promised you an inheritance, right? As, as being adopted as his child, there's an inheritance for you. There's redemption for you, right? And so to the praise of God's glory, it's all for God's glory. And he's saying the Holy Spirit is a sign is the sign that God's going to follow through is, is a good faith, you know, down payment to show like the best is yet to come. Here's just a little taste to show, just to prove to you that this is what's coming. Right. And so that the Holy Spirit, maybe you've never thought about the spirit in that way that, you know, we, whatever we might talk about when we think of the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, have you ever thought about the fact that the spirit is, is actually like a promise of the things yet to come is actually proof that those things are going to come, that God will follow through on the promises he's, he's made. Like, that's a cool way to think about that. Right. So, so God has, has blessed us in so many ways. God has done all these good things for us. And throughout Ephesians one, so far, we we're seeing one thing after another, and it's just such a cool passage. And you know, this run on sentence and just going on and on and on. It's like, Paul just can't, he's so excited. He can't hold it in. He's just got to keep rattling off and God did this and God did this and God did this. Right. And it's so exciting to think about the way, the things that God has done for us, to think about the things that God has been doing behind the scenes that maybe we weren't aware of, that maybe we would never have expected, that maybe we were skeptical of at one time or still are skeptical of, that God would ever care, that God would ever be doing things like that. But the, the, to find out that God actually has been working throughout all of time for us, for you and me, that God, what God is doing, you know, I, we, we tend to get fixated on what's going on in the here and now. We focus on, on the problems that we're facing right now. We focus on the future of where we'd like to be in the future. Or we focus on the past, on the good times or the bad times that we dwell on. And, and we, we have this like very narrow view on what is happening to me right now. Where do I want to be in the future? Where, where did I used to be in the past, right? And defining ourselves by that in those ways. And he's saying, there is such a bigger picture going on of what God has been doing before he even created the world. God was at work doing things and he had you and me in mind in that. And it was because of his love for us that God was doing these things, that God was at work. And he says, and you get to be a part of it. You get to have a part in that story. You get to be a member of that team. You get to be a child in that family. That God is doing something and he wants you to be a part of it. God wants you to be a part of what he has been doing. And God has a place for you in his story. Think about that. When you, the things that you spend your time worrying about, the things that you spend your time hoping for, the, the things that you spend your time, you know, planning and thinking and, and preparing for, the things that from the past that you dwell on, how would that change? How would your mindset on all those things change if you saw it in the light of what God has been doing and with the understanding that you are part of something so much bigger than your own life? That there's something incredible God is doing that he wants us to be a part of. And that's really exciting to think about. And it's also really disheartening to think about how many people don't realize that. The, the perceptions that they might have of God, or maybe they had faith in God of some form at one point in time and they've lost it. Maybe they've never really known much about God. Maybe they've never heard about Jesus, or maybe, you know, maybe they've never been interested in God. But you think about what God has been doing for us since long before we were born, long before even the creation of the world, that God has been at work for us in order to free us from the things that enslave us, in order to rescue us from, from the destructive ways that we live and we hurt other people and, and the way our actions affect others. To free us from meaninglessness, to free us from lack of purpose, to free us from just man, if all I have going for me is me, that's not very much, you know? And God has something so much bigger for us. And there are people who don't know that. And maybe you're one of those people. We need to understand, we need to fix our eyes and focus on the idea that God loves us so much that he has been at work preparing things for us, preparing us. He, he, is, he is putting together a massive, huge story that we get to have a role in, that we get to play a part in. And that starts with us understanding that invitation, understanding what we're being, invi being invited into.
The gospel is the most relevant thing ever. The good news of what God has done for us is the most relevant thing ever. But we lose sight of that when we stop focusing on it. When we stop looking at it, we stop thinking to look at it, right? We drift away. That happens because we're not being reminded of it, because we're not focusing on it. So what can you do this week to reflect on that? I'd encourage you, take some time, read this passage. Take some time to, to, to read it and reread it and reread it. Read it in different translations. Read it slowly and then read it again even slower and just reflect on what part of God's story am I playing? What part do, does God want me to play in his story? And pray that and ask God for that. And ask God, what, what part as, a part as my part of that story, who in my life doesn't know about this? That you, that you could use me to be a part of your story, to bring them into the story. Reflect on that and pray on that and ask God for that. All of God has been working throughout all of time to save all of you. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us, Lord, for saving us, for redeeming us. We thank you for choosing us and calling us. God, we thank you for giving us purpose and mission, for, for allowing us to be a part of your family, to be your children. God, we thank you for the, the promise of what is yet to come. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is the seal of those things. God, we thank you for all of it. God, and we thank you for this letter to the Ephesians that we can learn and benefit from. God, I pray that every person listening here would understand what you are calling them to, would hear you calling and speaking to them and leading them into the purpose that you have for them and how they can be a part of the story that you are telling. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.